Hey guys, well, welcome back to our Bible study in the book of Matthew. Well, it's the last week in the year. In another few days, it's a brand new year. And so with that in mind, I want to wish you and yours a really happy and a really prosperous 2019. Whatever 2018 brought, next year is a new year. New mercies, new blessings, um, a new touch from God. And so that's my prayer for you um, as we open up in uh, Matthew chapter uh, 8 today. And um, I have basically four points that I want to make in the eighth chapter. I hope some of you guys have been catching up. I noticed you've been going back and looking at the, uh, the previous uh, broadcast and you're getting uh, caught up. I hope everyone is caught up. But if not, we'll be on uh, chapter 9 in the, in the first week of 2019. And so you still have some time to get caught up. And even if you're not caught up, just jump right in. Again, I don't want to make this um, an issue of formality and something that if you're behind, you feel like you can't get on board, just jump in wherever you can. You know, God will honor you taking um, action in the moment, wherever you're at. Amen? All right. And so we're in uh, chapter eight. And as I said, there's uh, four things that I wanted to highlight from this chapter. And the first thing comes out of the very first interaction that Jesus has as he comes down off of the mountain, right? He gave the Sermon on the Mount. And so that was uh, completed uh, in, in chapter seven. And now he's coming down off the mountain. And as he comes off the mountain, it says, as Jesus came off the mountain, large crowds followed him. That's in verse one. And in verse two, it says, a man with leprosy, which was a terrible skin disease, that made people ceremonially unclean in that so much so that in the Jewish society, they had to be set aside. And, and honestly, you could not uh, communicate with them. You could not associate with them. They were really set aside like pariahs. And so a man with leprosy actually came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and he said, I'm willing. And immediately the man was cleansed of his leprosy. And so there's a lot to unpack in that scene. As I said, this man was a leper. And in that society, lepers were um, constricted to uh, leper colonies or leper zones where the quote unquote healthy or normal people would not go. And certainly there is no rabbi or esteemed teacher in Israel that would ever go near a leper. But here it is. Here's Jesus that when the man says, are you willing to heal me? Jesus says yes. And, and, and Jesus actually touches the man and he is healed. And I, I want to just touch on that for a moment because he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. If you are willing. And Jesus responds, yes, I'm willing. And I want you to know that that's still the case. Jesus is still willing. You know, whatever your ailment may be, your number one ailment, my number one ailment is a spiritual ailment, right? That's first and foremost what we need healing for is to restore that spiritual connection that is lost between us and God. And that's what Jesus is here doing. And that's what Jesus through his spirit is still doing to this day is calling men and women into a proper relationship with God the Father. And so our first and foremost need is a spiritual need. But Jesus also healed people physically. And many times the physical ministry was an entryway, was a doorway to the spiritual need. And so I just want you to know Jesus is willing. Jesus is willing to heal you um, spiritually. He's willing to uh, forgive you of your sins. He's willing to fill your heart. He's willing to show you a whole new way to live in alignment and um, as one in the Father. He has that power and he is willing to do it. And he's also willing to heal you in other ways. Maybe there are mental scars in your life. Maybe there are uh, relationship issues or other things that have hurt you or um, other areas where you feel damaged or let down or disappointed. Jesus is there to heal those things as well, as well as your physical healings. Like this man had leprosy. He had a skin disease and Jesus healed him. When you ask the question, Lord, are you willing? The answer is always yes. Now, the healing may be a matter of timing, right? And it may be the way in which that healing may occur, but the healing is always a yes. Jesus, are you willing? 
yes, I'm willing. I'm willing to heal you in any way you need to be healed. It just may be a matter of timing and it just may not come about in quite the way you imagined it or quite the way you thought it would be, but that healing is certain. And so I want you to just to take comfort from that, that you could cry out to Jesus in healing, just like for healing, just as this man did. And you could know that your healing is certain. Amen. And then the second thing that we touch on in the in the eighth chapter here is there's a beautiful um, scene that takes place between Jesus and a centurion who was a commander in the Roman army. And to be a centurion, you had to be over at least 100 men. And so this was a pretty important figure here. And the centurion, you can read the story, but he comes up to Jesus and he asked that Jesus actually heal his servant that he said was paralyzed. And Jesus again said, yes, I am willing. I'll provide that healing. But the faith of the centurion is so strong that he says, no, you don't have to come to my house. In fact, I feel unworthy that you would take the time to come to my house. But just say the word. Just, just, just pronounce right here that my servant is healed. And by faith, I receive that healing. I know it'll be done. I know that when I head back home, if you say he's healed, he's healed. And that great expression of faith actually stops Jesus in his tracks. In some uh, translations, it says Christ marveled at what this centurion was saying. And Jesus turns to, to the people around him. And in and, and, and this translation, it says he was amazed. And he said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I haven't found anyone of the people of God who have demonstrated faith like this to actually believe that at my spoken word that the deed is done, that it's rested, that's it. If Jesus says it, so be it. And that centurion exhibited that level of faith. And then at the very end of this exchange with the centurion, Jesus said to the centurion, all right, if you believe that strongly, go. Let it be done just as you believe it would. And his servant was healed right at that moment. And so, my friends, I want to say that right back to you. You know what? Jesus is willing. Jesus can heal. But sometimes it takes a little faith on our part. You see, Jesus says it'll be done just as you believed it would. And so I want to ask you today, my friend, what are you believing for? Because it'll be done just as you believe it will. And if you believe it can't be done or it won't be done, then that could also be right for you. You understand? And so God is not a big genie in the sky that we can manipulate and just say, oh, God, I believe. And so there it is. But in some instances, God requires that faith. He requires that affirmative belief for you to take that step. And to just believe that he has the power. Believe that he is willing. Like the, the man, the leper who spoke to the Lord said, look, if you're willing, you can make him, you can make me clean. Well, that was a prayer for himself. And he was saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He had no doubt that it could be done. He was just saying, is Jesus willing? Will Jesus do it? But he believed that Jesus had the power to do it. In the centurion's case, he said he wasn't believing for himself. He was actually believing for a stranger that was far away. And he believed. Just say the word because the centurion said, I'm a man of authority and I know how authority works. If I tell my men to jump, they say, how high? And so Jesus, you having authority over this illness, you tell the illness to leave, it goes. Period. End of story. And so my friend... We can't pull the slot machine and make God do anything, but we can believe. You can put your faith in him. You could put your belief in him because he is always willing. Again, it may not be in our timing. It may not be in the way we expect it, but it is sure. Amen. And then we see also, too, even sometimes when you don't have any faith, when you're not asking just by the grace of God, by the goodness of God, by the mercies of God, right? He heals you anyway. In verse 14, Jesus enters into Peter's house and Peter's mother is, or his mother-in-law actually is lying in bed and ill. 
And so what does Jesus do? Well, he touches her hand and she's healed. She immediately can get up and actually begins serving the folks. And so even sometimes when you don't exhibit the faith, you're just laying ill in bed, right? Jesus of his own volition, of his own will, of his own desire touches you and heals you. And that's what happened with Mary's mother here. And I want you to notice one other little point too here. In the discourse that Jesus had with the centurion before we move on, when he marvels at this centurion's faith, being a Roman and not being a part of uh, the Jewish community, being an outsider pretty much, an occupier, right? At the time, Romans were in charge of Palestine and all that area. He says to him that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about one day in heaven when there's this great feast. Many will come from the east and the west, but many of his own people will not come. And so I want you to know that, listen, friend, it's not where you're from. It's not a matter of your pedigree, your background, or whatever. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of he who believes. So you could be a Roman, you could be an occupier, right, of the territory, an enemy of the state. You can be from the hindermost parts of the world, but if you believe, if you have that faith in Jesus, then you're a part of the family of God. Amen? Amen. And then the third thing that I want to speak to you about today is in chapter uh, 8 and verse 18, where he talks about the cost of following Jesus, right? And so there's a story where as the crowds gather around Jesus and... Um, he told his disciples, look, meet me on the other side of the lake. People come up to Jesus and then start inquiring with him about, well, what's the cost of being a disciple? And so Jesus puts it right on the, on the line. He says, listen, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. In other words, he was letting them know that, listen, he wasn't holding on to material things Right? He was completely dependent upon the Father. And to be a disciple and to walk with Jesus, you're going to have to do the same thing. You may have to leave a lot behind and depend upon him. And even if whatever you take with you, your ultimate dependence is going to belong on him. And so one of the disciples said to him, well, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus says, tell you what. Why don't you just follow me and let the dead bury the dead? And what does that mean? Well, on the first hand, the gentleman was saying, let me go and bury my father because um, as the uh, eldest son, that was his responsibility in his household. But it didn't necessarily mean that his father was dying and this was something imminent that he had to go home and take care of. He wasn't saying, Lord, I have something to do this afternoon and I'll be back. He was saying, well, someday when my father dies, I have to wind up his estate and do all of my sonly duties. Then I might follow you. So pretty much he was saying he was making an excuse, really. He was saying at some point in the future, Jesus, I might follow you. And Jesus was saying, that's a mistake. What you need to do is to drop everything right now. There's an urgency to this. You see, my friends, no one has promised tomorrow. We don't know what the future holds. Right now, if you're hearing the voice of the Lord... Your responsibility is to respond to it, to say yes, to take that extra step, to go the, um, the extra mile. You may not go the full distance. None of us will go the full distance in this lifetime because we're still growing and learning and changing, right? But when you hear the voice, the Bible says that you shouldn't harden your heart. You should step up. And that's what Jesus was saying. Like, look, if you're going to be my disciple, you need to step up. Kind of like how the other disciples were. They dropped their nets. Right? They were at their business and they laid that down and followed Jesus. And that's the level of commitment that he was calling this believer to. You know, no one wants lukewarm discipleship. No one likes lukewarm anything. Think of a lukewarm drink. You get your, your cup of tea or, or, or your coffee and it becomes lukewarm. You're like, ah, throw it out. Right? No one likes lukewarm. In fact, in the book of Revelations, uh, Jesus actually accused one church of being lukewarm. And he said that it was horrible. He wanted to spit it out of his mouth like lukewarm water. And so there, there's, no, there's no place for lukewarm discipleship. But if you're sticking your toe in the water or if you've drifted and you're coming back, Jesus' arms are wide open to you, my friend. The call 
still remains. And then the fourth thing I'm going to leave you with is this episode where the disciples are in the boat. Jesus is also in the boat. They're out on the lake and this massive storm comes out of nowhere. And of course they panic and they run to Jesus and they're saying, Lord, you're, 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 you're good. we're going to die. What are you doing? We're perishing. And what's Jesus doing? Well, in the text, he's asleep in the boat. And so here are the disciples having this freak out. And Jesus is saying, easy, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid? And then he got up and he calmed the wind. So here in the first part, we see the man with the leprosy having the faith to ask for his healing. Then we see the centurion and he's got the faith to ask for his servant's healing, right? Jesus commends their faith. And then here he rebukes the disciples about their lack of faith, right? He says, look, I'm in the boat. I'm in the boat. And maybe you need to know that today, friend, that Jesus is in the boat. Whatever boat you're in, whatever the stormy seas you're on, whatever rough road you're traveling, whatever you're going through, Jesus is in the boat. He is there. He's around the corner. He's right with you. One of my favorite names of God in the Old Testament is Jehovah Shammah, which means the God who is there. Jesus said in the New Testament, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so he is there. And so I want to leave you with that for 2018, my friend. Maybe this year you didn't feel like that all the time, like the Lord was there. But I guarantee you that he was there. And in time, you're going to look back and see that he was there. And in this new year that we're looking to, he's going to be right there as well. He was in the boat. He was relaxing while this storm was brewing. And what he was saying to the disciples, what he's still saying to you today, I got this. Do not fear. Do not worry. Do not panic. Because even in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the, 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 the illness, the worry, the fear, the lack, I got this. I am willing and I got this. Amen? Amen, my friends. Remember, the Lord loves you and I love you and I'll see you in 2019. Don't forget to give me a like, a comment, or a share and DM me with any prayer requests or anything you'd like to talk about. God bless you.